Hello everybody and welcome to another YouTube video. So in today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you five Python mini projects for complete beginners. Now each of these projects shouldn't take us longer than about 15 or 20 minutes to actually code out. What I'm going to be doing is giving you kind of a starting template for these. So I'm not starting with any code pre-written or anything like that. In fact, everything I'm doing here is completely from scratch. I don't have any code on my other monitors or anything like that. And the idea behind this is I'm going to show you my kind of thought process in creating these games, explain to you why I've written the code that I did and kind of how it works. And then that should hopefully give you guys a good idea how to go about extending these games and kind of customizing them to your liking. Now, as I said, these are for complete beginners. When I say complete beginners, I'm kind of referencing people that have a little bit of familiarity with Python, have maybe looked at the syntax a bit, but aren't quite comfortable yet, are still considering themselves beginners and kind of want some projects to work on and some, I guess, things that they can use to actually apply their skills rather than just looking at straight theoretical tutorials. So anyways, with that said, I hope you guys are looking forward to this. Let's get into it after a quick word from our sponsor. Before we get started, I need to thank the sponsor of this video, which is Algo Expert. Algo Expert is the best platform to use for preparing for your software engineering coding interviews and has the highest quality coding interview practice questions. With 155 practice questions, detailed solutions in nine of the most popular programming languages, a feature-packed browser-based coding environment, extensive test suites and conceptual overviews and code walkthroughs for each and every problem, Algo Expert is the best resource to use to ace your coding interviews. Algo Expert also has a data structures crash course, coding interview assessments, and a mock interviews feature. I can highly recommend Algo Expert as a former customer myself and now an official instructor on the platform. Get started using Algo Expert today by clicking the link in the description and using the code Tech with Tim for a discount on the platform. All right, so the five projects I have for you and in the order in which I'm going to be showing you them is a quiz game, a number guesser game, rock, paper, scissors, choose your own adventure, and then finally a password manager. Now, these are going in the order of difficulty. So the first one I'm showing you is the simplest. The last one I'm showing you will be the hardest, but the last one is still not going to be that hard. If you're a complete beginner, you should still be able to actually code it out and understand what's going on. Now, if you guys want to skip to a certain project, you don't want to go through one of them, whatever, there will be some timestamps in the description and kind of chapters on the video timeline. So feel free to skip through to whatever you want. And now what I'm going to do is quickly show us how we can set up our environment and then we'll get started working on this first project, which is the quiz game. All right. So right now I'm using something called Visual Studio Code. This is known as an IDE, an integrated development environment. You totally do not need to use this. If you have this installed and you know how it works, go for it. But for most of you, I'm going to recommend you something called IDLE. So when you install Python, and I'm going to assume you have Python installed at this point in time, what you're going to do is open up this app called IDLE. If you're on Windows, you can search for it on the Windows bar. If you're on Mac, you can look for it in the spotlight search, which is in the top right hand corner. So open up IDLE. Again, this is installed by default when you install the kind of vanilla version of Python. And this is going to bring up something known as the interactive shell. Now, this is not where you write your code. I want to make that very clear. A lot of people make the mistake of writing all their code here. No, don't do that. What you want to do if you're using this is go to file, press a new file. And now you have the place you're actually going to be writing your code. So the first thing I recommend you do is save this file. So save it in a folder, save it on your desktop, wherever, and name it something, right? Name it like the name of the project, quiz game, uh, choose your own adventure game, whatever. I would recommend you make new files for every one of the new projects that you are working on. And so I'll just get, give you an example here. I'm going to save this as test.py. And now if I go in here and I type, you know, print hello, just some basic Python syntax. The way I actually run this code here is I press run and then run module or alternatively, I press the F5 key and then notice it's going to bring up this interactive shell. It's going to print out and run your program and then you can go back here, modify it, save it. And whenever you want to run it, you press F5 or press uh, run and then run module. All right. So hopefully that give you, gives you guys an idea how to set up your environment. Obviously, feel free to download Visual Studio Code as well. Leave a link to it in the description or use any coding environment uh, that you're comfortable with and that you know how to use. So right now I have a Python file open. This is a file that's on my desktop. It doesn't really matter where you put the file. And the first thing I'm going to do here is start working on the quiz game. So this quiz game, the idea behind it is we want to ask the users a bunch of questions. And then if they give us the right answer to these questions, we'll kind of add one to their score. 
then at the end of the program, we'll print out what they got out of the number of questions. So if there was 10 questions, we would say, hey, you got, you know, three out of 10 or seven out of 10 or whatever. And maybe we'll even give them a percentage or something like that. So let's get started. The first thing I'm going to do here is use the print command or the print function. I'm going to assume you guys are familiar with this, but when you want to print something to the screen, output something to the console, you say print, you put some value in here. The value you typically put is a string. A string is anything encapsulated in double quotation marks or single quotation marks. And then this will be what is outputted. So the first thing I'm going to do is just kind of welcome my users to the game. I'm going to say welcome to my and then computer quiz. So the specific quiz I'll go with is a computer quiz. Please feel free to go with whatever type of quiz that you want. All right. Now we've welcomed the user to our game. Let's just quickly test this out in VS code to run your code. You press this little uh, kind of run button right here. You're going to see it should open up a terminal down here and then notice it says welcome to my computer quiz uh, because the program just ran. Awesome. So now what I want to do is ask the user if they want to play my game. If they say no, I don't want to play, then we'll just immediately quit the game. So to do that, I'm going to create a variable. I'm going to say playing is equal to and then I'm going to use this function called input. Now, what input allows you to do is ask the user to start typing something in in the console. So inside of input in here, you put what's known as the prompt. Now, the prompt is kind of what appears before the user can start typing. So, for example, if you're asking the user for their name, you may have the prompt be name and then colon and then maybe a space. And then right here after this space, the user could start typing whatever their name was. So in my case, I would put Tim and then whatever they type after the prompt. And then when they press enter, that will be stored in playing. So if I type Tim and then I press enter, now playing will be equal to Tim because after the prompt, that's what the user typed uh, before they hit enter, right? Hopefully that kind of makes sense. And even if the user has a space, they say like Tim and then R, all of this Tim space R will be included in playing because this is all the stuff they typed after the prompt before they pressed enter. So I'm going to ask them here, do you want to play? Question mark. And then I'm going to add a space here. The reason I'm adding a space is because if I don't add a space, then the user is going to start typing right on the question mark. And that's going to be kind of all smushed together and it doesn't look nice. And so we're going to add a space to make sure the user starts typing one space after the question mark. All right. So now if I run my program, so I press the run button, it says welcome to my computer quiz. Do you want to play? Notice the cursor is here and now I can start typing whatever I want. When I press enter, nothing's happening because we haven't done that yet. We haven't configured that, uh, but that's kind of the basics. That's how you get user input. And just to show you here, if I print out playing, what this will do is give me whatever the value of this variable is. So if I run this here, it's welcome to my computer quiz. Do you want to play? I'll say yes. And then it prints out. Yes. Right. So pretty straightforward. OK, so now that we know if the user wants to play or not, right, because after this line is done, we'll have something stored in playing. We want to check if the user typed yes. Right. And specifically, if they didn't type yes, we want to end the program. So what I'm going to do is use something known as an if statement. Now, an if statement allows us to conditionally check kind of uh, or compare values together and see if something is true or false. And so I'm just going to write out the kind of entire if statement, and then I'll uh, run through it step by step. I'm going to say if playing does not equal to so an exclamation point and then the equal sign and then I'm going to say yes then what I want to do is I want to quit the program and there's this function in Python that you can use called quit and this will just immediately terminate the program so what I'm doing is using if I'm writing what's known as my condition this is the thing that I want to check so I want to check if the variable playing which is what the user typed in is not equal to yes the reason I'm checking if it's not equal to yes is because if they typed anything other than the word yes, I want to quit the program. Whereas if they typed yes, I don't want to quit. And so what happens here is we're going to compare whatever the user typed in with yes. And since we're using not equal to if what the user typed in is not equal to yes, this condition evaluates to a Boolean, which is known as true. And then if this is true, right? So if whatever the condition is, is true, then whatever is indented after this colon here is going to be run. So hopefully that makes sense. I won't go too much more into the syntax. I assume you guys can probably figure it out yourself. But the idea is you put a colon and then all the stuff you want to happen when this condition is true, you indent here and an indent is kind of four spaces. I would recommend you use tabs rather than kind of going one, two, three, four. You'll get some issues uh, with your indentation if you try to do spaces and tabs together. So anyways, let's just see this now. Uh, let's run this program. OK, 
I'm going to say, welcome to my computer quiz. Do you want to play? I'm going to type yes. And well, the program is going to end regardless because we're not doing anything after this if statement. But if I go here and I print, OK, uh, exclamation point, and then let's play smiley face. Um, oops. OK, I need to fix my quotations here. Yeah, OK, that's all good. Let's run this now. It says, welcome to my computer quiz. Do you want to play? I'll type yes. And it says, OK, let's play. Right. And then it gives a really bad smiley face that I need to fix. And if we run this one more time and then this time we type no, notice that it doesn't say, OK, let's play because this condition was true. And so the program quit. All right, so that's about if statements. Hopefully that all makes sense. We're going to be using a lot of if statements in this video. So now that we say, OK, let's play, what we want to do is ask the user their first question. And so what we're going to do is the exact same thing we did when we were asking the user if we want to play. We're going to say some variable. I'm just going to call it answer because that seems to make sense is equal to and then input. And then I'm going to put whatever the question is. I'm going to say, you know, ask something about a computer. I'll say, what does CPU stand for? Question mark. And then what I'm expecting is that the user is going to type in the answer, right? And so what I'm going to do is just add a space here to make sure that, again, the user is not typing right beside the question mark. They have a little bit of space. And now what I want to do is check if the user's answer is equal to the correct answer. So I'm going to say if answer is equal to and then I need to type out what the actual answer is. Now, in this case, this is central processing unit. And I think I spelled processing correct. Obviously, you're going to want to make sure your answers are actually spelled correctly, because even if the user types in central processing unit, but they like forgot the G or they spell something wrong or they have like a capital P, uh, they're going to have the question marked as incorrect because the answer has to match exactly with what the user typed in. OK, so now we have a colon and now we're saying, OK, well, if the answer was equal to central processing unit, what do we want to do? I'm going to print that they got it correct. So I'll say correct like that. And notice I'm using single quotes and double quotes kind of interchangeably. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you use so long as you're consistent with the starting and, uh, and ending quote. Awesome. So let's just run this now and see if this works. So I'm going to press run. It says, uh, welcome to my computer game. Do you want to play? Yes. OK, let's play. What does CPU stand for? Central processing unit. And then it gives me the, uh, the output saying correct. Now, if I run this again, do you want to play? Yes. OK, let's play. What does CPU stand for? I type in just CPU. It doesn't give me anything because, well, this was not true. Sweet. OK, so now the thing is, though, if the user gets this wrong, I want to tell them that they got it incorrect, right? We need some output saying them saying, hey, no, that was not correct. And so what we're going to use now is what's known as the else statement. So whenever you have an if statement like this and you are checking if something is equal to something else, and that's what the two equal sign is doing, or you have some condition here. If this condition here does not evaluate to true, you can put this else statement here, which means if this is not true, whatever's in the else statement will run. So if I go here and I say print incorrect exclamation point. Now, if this is false, so if the answer does not equal central processing unit, then we will print out incorrect. If we type anything, doesn't matter, just so long as this right here that we typed out is equal to false, whatever's in the else here will end up run. So let me just show you what I mean, and then we can talk about this a bit more. So let's run. Do you want to play? Yes. OK, let's play. What does CPU stand for? Central processing unit. And then it says correct. And oops, I, I should have typed in the incorrect one, but that's fine. Let's just type in no. And then notice it gives me incorrect. And if I ran this one more time, type yes, and I type some other random thing, it still gives me incorrect. So if I type anything other than central processing unit, the else statement runs. And again, the syntax for the else statement is you write else. You do a colon and then any stuff you want to run, you do indented after the else. And you could do multiple things as well. I could do another print statement and then both of these print statements would run uh, if we got this question incorrect. Sweet. OK, so now we have our first question. And now what we can do is kind of just copy this to do the rest of our questions. Right. So I'll copy this uh, one more time. I'll do four questions for my quiz. Please feel free to do more. And it's totally fine if we want to leave this answer variable the same. I don't need to change this to be something else. Uh, we could if we want to. But since we are done using the answer for this question after this if statement, it's fine if we use the same variable to store the answer for our next question. So now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of remove all of our answers and questions. And we're going to type in, well, new answers and new questions. And I'll show you some more things that we can do here and kind of some fixes and all that as we go through. But let's just get our questions done first. 
All right. So now my next question, I'll say, what does GPU stand for? Question mark. And then this will be, and I'll copy this, graphics processing unit. Okay, so let's go graphics processing unit like that. I hope that's correct. And then the next question we can ask, um, <laughs> I'll just do a bunch of acronyms. What does RAM stand for? Question mark. This will be random access memory like that. Okay. And then lastly, we can say, what does PSU stand for? Question mark. And we'll just say power supply like that. Sweet. So now we've got all of our different questions here and we're kind of printing out whether we got them correct or incorrect. So let's just quickly test this out. Let's make sure this is all working. So uh, do you want to play? Yes. What does CPU stand for? Central processing unit. What does GPU stand for? Notice I didn't add the space here. And since I didn't add the space, you're going to see when I start typing here, that's kind of smushed with the question mark. So I'll say graphics processing unit. What does RAM stand for? Random access memory. Okay. And what does PSU stand for? Let's just type PSU and then notice it tells me incorrect. So I'm going to start by fixing these spaces here. You guys saw what happened when I didn't add the space for the input. So now it should be all spaced out properly. Sweet. So now we've got this all working. Hopefully you guys are all familiar with this if and kind of else syntax. Now uh, it just needs to be in this structure. Whenever you have a colon, typically in Python, the next line after that does need to be indented. If I did this and like I didn't indent this line here, you can see we're getting this red highlight and it's the reason we're getting that is because uh, the indentation is all messed up. This is supposed to be indented after we have the else statement. And a small note, you can only have the else statement after an if statement, right? So I can't just randomly come down here and put an else statement. It needs to come after an if statement appears, right? So hopefully that's clear. Okay. So now the one thing that I want to show you though, is that we might be getting some kind of weird results from our program that we don't expect. So I'm going to run my program and I'm going to say, do you want to play? And I'm just going to type yes with a capital Y. And notice when I do that, it doesn't actually start my program, right? It immediately quits. And the reason for that is whenever you have a capital that is different than lowercase, right? So if you have yes, that is not equal to yes. These are different strings. And so if we want to check if the person's answer, regardless of the case, right? If they have a capital Y or a capital E or a capital S or something, or, you know, multiple capitals, if we want Y cap or capital Y, capital E, lowercase s um, to be valid and to allow the user to play, we need to do something. Now, there is this method in Python called dot lower. And what dot lower does is it takes whatever text we type in and it just makes it completely lowercase. So if I go here and I print, you know, Tim is great like that. And then I say dot lower. And actually, let me do this in another way that's not as confusing. Let me say text is equal to this. And then I say text dot lower. What this will do, and make sure you have the parentheses, by the way, is it will convert all of this text to lowercase. So if I just run my program here and we have a look at our terminal, notice that, uh, wait, oh, I have to type something. Let's just type that. It says Tim is great, all in lower cases. And so we can use this here to convert all of the answers that our user types in to lower cases. So I can say playing dot lower, and then if the user typed in something with capitals, it will just all be lowercase. And that way, if they type yes with any different casing, it will still evaluate to true uh, because we're converting it to lower. Now, in the same fashion, there is this something called upper. If you say dot upper, it will convert everything into upper cases. And so then what you would do if you're using dot upper is you would make your answer in complete upper cases because you know you're always going to be converting anything lowercase to uppercase. So hopefully that's clear, but we're going to just throw dot lower on here to all of our answers. So I'm going to say dot lower. I'm going to say dot lower. I'm going to say dot lower going to say dot lower. And alternatively, if you didn't want to do it this way, you could actually just do it at the end of this input here. You could say input dot lower, and then you could just remove this because now your answer is already converted to dot lower. So you don't need to convert it kind of in this condition right here. Okay. Hopefully that's all clear, but yeah, that's just taking your answer, converting it into lowercase, and then you're checking if the lowercase answer is equal to, well, the lowercase answer you actually have. All right. So let's rerun this. I'm going to open up my terminal. I'm going to run. Do you want to play? I'm going to type yes with a capital Y. Notice this works now. And now I'm going to do some capitals. So central processing unit. That works, right? GPU, graphics, 
processing unit, and then you get the idea. I won't do the rest of them. OK, so the last thing I want to do here is implement some notion of score, right? We want to be able to tell how many questions our users got correct. So what I'm going to do is make a variable here at the top of my program. I'm going to say score is equal to zero. This is going to allow us to keep track of how many correct answers they have. Now, all we have to do here, since we define score equal to zero, is every time the user gets a question correct, we just need to increment score. So add one to score. So inside of this if statement here, because this is if the user got it correct, right? I'm going to say score plus equals one. What that says is, OK, take the value of score and add one to it. That's equivalent to saying score is equal to score plus one. So hopefully that's clear, but that's a way that you can just add one to the variable. And so if we add one to score every time we get something correct, that means that at the end of our program, we'll have some number, right? We'll have two, three, zero, whatever, however many questions we got right. We can then use that to display how well the user did. So I'm going to just say score plus equals one. I'm going to do this inside of all of these if statements here. OK, and now we've added one to score. So now what I can do at the very end of my program, once we're done with all our questions, is I can say you got and then I need to use a plus sign. This is a concatenation operator. I'll discuss this in a second score plus and then questions correct exclamation point. But I need to convert this to a string. So let me go through what I just did here. OK, so I said you got I did a space. Notice I manually added the space here. I then had a plus sign and then I said string score and then plus questions correct. So the reason I'm doing this string here is because score is a number, right? Score is an integer. It's not a string. And so if I tried to do something like, you know, Tim plus one, well, this doesn't really make much sense, right? Because I'm trying to add a number to a string. And like, how do you add one to text? That's just an undefined operation that doesn't exist. So what I need to do instead is convert this one to a string. Because now that I have two strings, when I add them together, what I get in Python is Tim one, right? They kind of get combined. And so that's what I can do. I'm going to convert this score here into a string. So then when I add it to the other strings that I have here, it's valid. This operation works and I'm not getting uh, some issue popping up. OK, and then I'm adding the questions correct. So I'm kind of putting this string score in the middle of the string, right? You got whatever the number is questions correct. OK, so let's run this. And you want to play? Yes. I'm going to say, let's CPU stand for central processing unit. OK, graphics processing unit. OK, PSU RAM. And it says incorrect. You got two questions correct. Right now, it's giving me how many questions I got correct. And so the very last thing we can do here is we can copy this line and we can give them kind of a percentage, right? Like you got 50%, or you got whatever percent. And the way we do that is now we're just going to take our score. We're going to divide it by the number of questions that we have is four. And then we're going to multiply all of this by 100, right? And if we want to be extra clear here, what we can do is put parentheses around this score over four to make sure this operation happens first before we multiply by 100. But you'll see if we did it the other way around, we didn't add the parentheses, it would still work fine because we would do the division before we did the multiplication. But anyways, we're going to say now instead of you got questions correct, we're going to say you got. And then we're just going to add a percent on here. Now, notice I'm not doing a space. And since I'm not doing a space, it's going to be whatever this number is and then plus and then the percent sign. So it will come right after and then we can do a period. So now we've calculated the uh, the percent again, just taking the score, dividing it by our number of questions, which is four and then multiplying it by 100. Now, note here, if you change the number of questions, you got to change this number, right? So let's go here and let's run this. And let's go to our terminal. Yes, we'll play. Uh, I'll just type something random. OK, random access memory. Correct. And then power supply. And then it says you got 50 percent. You got two questions. Correct. And with that, that is going to wrap up our first Python mini project. So I know I went really slowly through this and really explained everything in depth. That's because this is the very first project. I'm trying to make sure this video works for everyone, regardless of your skill level. And now I will go a little bit faster. I won't re-explain a lot of the syntax that I've already explained now as we move into the new projects. Just anything new that I kind of come across or that we use, uh, I will explain. But this is our first project. This is the quiz game. There will be some code that has or there will be a link, sorry, that has this code in the description if you want to download this yourself. Uh, but I would highly recommend you modify this, you know, change around, maybe add like more than one point for questions that are worth 
you know, more than one point that are more difficult or something like that, right? And you guys can do this as you please. Regardless, that is the quiz game. Now we're going to move on to do a number guesser. I think this is the one I was saying I was going to do second. So this one is pretty straightforward. But what we're going to do is generate a random number and we're going to track how many times it takes the user to guess this number. And so what I'm going to do is zoom in a bit here so that we can uh, see our code. The first thing I'm going to do is import this module in Python called red. All right. So first thing to mention here is that this right here is what's known as a module. So when you import random, you're importing the random module. Now, this just lets you use all of the functionality that's kind of in here. This is default. This is installed by with Python by default. You don't need to install it or anything like that. In quick note, there is modules that are built by, you know, people like me or other developers out there and you can import them, uh, but you have to install them first. This one is just built into Python by default. And so no installation is required. Anyways, let me show you how to make a random number. So there's a few different ways to do this, but the two simplest ways are to do random dot and then rand range. And then you're going to do an open and closing parenthesis. And let me get rid of the print statement so we can see this better for right now. And here you're going to put the start and then the stop of the range for your random number. So you would do something like negative one if you wanted to start the range at negative one and stop at 10. Excuse me. And then what this would do is generate a random number that goes from negative one to 10, but does not include 10. So that's very important. The number you put here is the absolute upper bound. You cannot have the number 10 be generated if 10 is here. If you wanted the range to generate a number between negative one and 10, you'd have to put 11. Again, I don't know why they do that. There's just some things in Python that aren't necessarily intuitive for beginners. But with this is 11, it's not going to generate 11. It will generate up to 10. So make sure that's clear. Now, there's another thing you can do here. If you want the range to just start at zero, you can say random dot rand range and just put the stop. If you just put one thing here, what this will do is generate a random number between zero and this number minus one. So up to 10. And yeah, there you go. That's how that works. Uh, OK, so let's do something from negative five to 11. And let's say R is equal to random dot rand range. And let's just print R. OK, so let me run this. And we'll look at our thing here. Okay, run. And notice we get a five. Now, if I run this again, we're getting a negative three. I run a bunch of times, we get a bunch of random numbers. You see, this is random. <laughs> and there you go, that's working. We got a nine. We can just run a bunch of times. We got a 10. Notice we won't get 11 if we do this. Sweet. So we're getting a random number. So that's one way. Another way to do this is with a function called rand int. Now, rand int works the exact same way as rand range, except now it will include 11. So the upper bound range now includes the number that you typed, doesn't go up to, but not included. So now if I do negative five to 11, 11 will possibly be generated. So if I run this now, uh, we get six, right? And we, if we keep running it, we might see that we get 11. Um, okay, I'm not, <laughs> this could take a while. Yeah, there you go. So we do get 11, so that works. Okay, sweet. Uh, and same thing here, if you decide to not include the start, it will just generate up to and including this end number that you put right here. So that's how you make a random number. So what we want to do is generate a random number. So actually, let's let's leave this here. Let's say random underscore number. And then we want to ask the user to guess this number. And every single time they guess it, we're going to tell them if they were above or below the number so that they can do it in like a reasonable number of guesses, especially if we make this number like really large. Right. So the first thing I'm going to actually ask the user is how large of a number they want to generate. So we'll assume it starts at zero and then we'll ask them to type in a number and uh, we'll generate up to that number. So I'm going to say, um, let's say top of range is equal to and then input and we'll say type a number. We won't even tell them what it's for. We'll just say type a number. OK, so now they're going to type a number. So what we actually need to do here is we need to make sure that this uh, thing they typed in here is a number. Because if the user types in like hello or Tim or some random string, something that's not a number, then we can't use that, right? And we also need to make sure the number they type in is greater than zero. So I'll show you how we do that. I'm going to say if the top of range dot is digit, OK? And then I'm going to do an if statement inside of this if statement. I'm going to say if the int, and actually, we're going to do this. We're going to say top of range is equal to int top of range. And let me pause here and explain what I'm doing. So first of all, uh, you can make a variable using underscores. When you want to have multiple words, it makes a lot of sense to make the name with underscores. So like top underscore of underscore range. You can't have a variable that's like top range. 
that won't work. You need to have it connected. Uh, you can't have like two separate words like that. Anyways, this is equal to input. The user is going to type something in. Now, by default, when the user types something in, it's going to return it to us with double quotation marks. So it's going to be a string. So even if the user types in like 25, it's going to be returned to us like this. And this here for Python is not considered a number. It's not considered an integer. It's considered a string. And so we need to convert this 25 so that it looks like this. So that's actually a number. And the way you do that is you use this function called int. So you surround the string with int, and then it will convert this string into its numeric representation. So it will give us 25. However, if you try to convert something that's not an actual integer into an int, it's going to fail. You're going to get an error. And so we need to make sure that what the user typed in is a digit before we try to convert it into an int. And the way you check that is with this is digit method. So I say if top of range dot is digit, what is digit will do is return to us true if this is a number, otherwise it will return false. And so if this right here is true, we will convert top of range into an integer. So top of range is equal to int top of range. Then we will check if top of range is greater than zero. So we'll say if top of range is uh, actually we're going to say less than zero, less than or equal to zero specifically, then what we will do is we'll print out please type a number larger than zero next time. And then we'll just quit. So we'll tell them what they did wrong. And then we're just going to quit the program right there. Otherwise, if we make it through all of this, we're good. But one thing we need to do here is we need to put an else and we need to put quit and we need to put a print statement that says, please type a number next time. So let me run through this. What we're doing is checking if it is a digit, if it's not a digit. So in the else statement, we need to tell them, hey, you got to type in a digit. It doesn't work if you don't type in a number, right? And then we quit. Now, if that works, if it is a digit, we convert it into an int. We make sure it's greater than zero. If it isn't, then we tell them, hey, you got to type in a number and then we quit. But if we make it through all of this and we don't quit, so we've now converted the number to an int, we can now use that number to generate our random number. So we can say random number, random dot rand int, and then we can put top of range as our variable for generating that random number. And we'll now generate up to whatever number they typed in. Sweet. So now that we have that, let's just print out the random number and let's just test this and make sure it's all working. So I'm going to run this type a number. Let's type five. And we got one issue rand int missing one potential argument B. OK, so this is my fault. I was saying when we used rand int, we could just include the top of the range. That's false. We need to include the bottom of the range as well. So I'm going to put zero there and now this should work. So let's run this and let's type a number. Let's type five. And there you go. We generated a random number, which was four. If we run this again, type five, we get three. You can see this is indeed working. Sweet. So now that we have our random number, we want to keep asking the user to type in a guess for the number until they get it correct. And so I'm going to use a while loop here and I'll explain how this works in a second. I'm just going to say while well, true. Now, what this means is, OK, we're going to do whatever is indented after this while loop here, after the colon, while this condition, whatever is at the top of here is true. So right now, if we just decided to like print Tim, this would happen infinitely. This loop would never stop unless we actually like manually close the program. The reason is because there's no way for this to end, right? I say while true, well, true is always true. And so we're just always going to print 10. However, it, we, there is this keyword, it's called break. And what break will do is immediately stop the loop as soon as this line of code is executed. So what we can do is use this break keyword to break out of the loop, stop running the loop as soon as the user types in the correct number. So we're going to say while true, this is the condition for the while loop. We could do a, a real condition. We could say something like while um, like input and actually we'll say like user guess is not equal to random number. We could do something like that. That would work as well. But I want to show you using the break keyword. So instead, we're going to do while true. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by asking the user to guess what the number is, right? That's the very first thing we do every single time we ask them. We say, OK, make a guess. So I'm going to say uh, user underscore guess is equal to and then input. I'm going to say make a guess colon. Now, same thing here. We need to check if the user's guess is actually an integer, right? And so I'm going to copy exactly what we just did right here. And I'm going to paste it down below and I'm going to say, OK, 
if the, and now instead of saying top of range, I'm going to say user underscore guess dot is, is digit, then user underscore guess is equal to int of user underscore guess. And then I'll even take this and we don't need to check if the number is less than zero. That's fine. Uh, we can just do this. So I'm going to say, and I'm going to get rid of this, this quip. Okay. Let me explain this. But what I'm saying is, okay, the user guess is equal to input, make a guess. They're going to type in some number. This comes in as a string. We need to make sure that what they've typed in is actually a number. If it is a number, we'll convert it to a number. We're all good. However, if it is not a number, then we're going to say, please type a number next time. And we're going to use this keyword called continue. Now, what continue will do is automatically bring us back to the top of our loop. So it's a little bit different than break rather than ending the loop. It just brings us back to the very top. So if I did something down here, like printed after continue, if we hit this continue keyword, this won't run. We won't print. We'll just go back up to the top of the loop and ask the user to make another guess. And so that's what we're going to do. However, we're going to come down here now. We're going to say if the user guess is equal to the random number, we're going to print and we're going to say you got it. You got it correct. Otherwise, we'll say else print. You got it wrong. So if they didn't get it right, they got it wrong, obviously, right? Whereas if they uh, didn't type a number, we'll just say, please type a number next time. And then we'll continue rather than doing this and telling them they got it wrong after they didn't even type a number in. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. We can test this out though and make sure it's working. So save the program and run now type a number. Let's type a number. Let's say 10. Okay. Make a guess. We're going to guess three and wow. Okay. We actually got it. Um, that's great. But notice that it's still asking us to keep making guesses and to quit this. You can type control C on your keyboard. If you get into an infinite loop, the reason it's telling us to do that is because we didn't break out of the while loop, right? We said you got it, but we didn't stop. And to stop, we need to use the break keyword. So now you'll see if we do guess it, we'll immediately stop looping. Whereas if we don't get it, we will continue looping because the break keywords not here. So let's run this now type a number. Let's just go up to five, make a guess one. You got it wrong. Okay. We'll guess two. You got it wrong. Three. You got it wrong. Four. You got it wrong. Five. You got it. Sweet. And then we exit the loop. There you go. Okay. So that's working fine. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to keep track of how many times the user actually makes a guess. So to do this, I'm going to make a variable similar to what we had with score before. I'm going to say guesses is equal to zero. And now every single time we start this while loop again, I'm going to increment add one to guesses. So I'm going to say guesses plus equals one. So at the very top of the loop, we'll increment guesses. So the first time this runs, guesses will be equal to one. We'll go through all of this. Then we'll come back up to the top. Guesses will now be equal to two. The user will now make another guess. And now when we exit this while loop, once this is done, we're going to print out how many guesses they got. And I'm going to show you a different way to do this this time. I'm going to say you got it in and then we'll say comma guesses and then the string guesses. So another way to print multiple things on the same line is to use commas. So I'm going to say you got it in and then I'm going to say whatever the number of guesses is. Notice I don't need a space here. Whenever you have uh, commas separating your different things that you're printing out, it will automatically add spaces in between them. And then notice here, I didn't even convert this to a string. And that's because the print statement is smart enough to say, okay, hey, this is an int. I'm going to convert this into a string for you and kind of automatically add it to this string. So what we were doing manually before the print statement can just do for us. And so this time we'll let the print statement do it. Uh, this line here is completely equivalent to just having the, uh, the plus the space, the string, uh, the other plus and the space, right? It's the exact same thing. Okay. So let's go back to what we had and there you go. We are all good. Now let's just run this and I am going to show you how we can tell them if they got it uh, greater than or less than because I did tell you that we were going to do that. Okay. So let's run this and let's say type a number. Let's go five, make a guess one. You got it wrong Two. you got it. And then it says you got it in two guesses. Sweet. All is working. So now the last thing we want to do is tell the user if they were greater than or less than the number so that they can kind of narrow down their guesses. And so rather than just telling them you got it wrong now inside of the else statement, we're going to check if the user was above or if they were below. And there's a ton of different ways to do this. I'm just going to do it this way. I'm going to say if the user guess is greater than the random number, then what I want to do is say print you were above 
the number. Exclamation point. Otherwise, I'm going to say print. And I'll say you were below the number. All right, so let's run through this. We're just checking if the user guess is greater than whatever the random number is. If it is, we're going to tell them they were above the number. Otherwise, if it wasn't greater than, it must be less than. And we're going to say you were below the number. Now, some of you may have heard that statement. If it wasn't greater than, it must be less than. You say, no, it could be equal to. That's correct. But the thing is, up here, we checked if it was equal to. And so if it was equal to, we would have uh, gone into here. We would not have hit this else statement. So if we're in this else statement, we know we must not be equal to the random number. And so instead, what we can do is just run this if statement that's inside of the else. I'm going to show you a more elegant way to do this in one second. But let's just run the program and see if this works. Now. OK, let's run this type a number. Let's type 20. Make a guess. Let's guess 10. You were above the number. Okay, so now I don't have to guess below 10. So I'm going to guess five. You were above the number. Okay, it's less than five. Uh, four, three, two, one. You got it in nine guesses. Okay, so anyways, that did work, but it was telling us whether we were above or below. Uh, let's see if I can guess something that's actually, I guess I couldn't have guessed anything below one. So let's run this again. Let's type 10. Let's guess one. And then this time it is telling us we're below the number. Okay, great. So that is working. OK, so the one thing I want to show you here is how we can clean this up a little bit using something new that we haven't seen yet, which is known as an L if statement. So an L if statement is something that kind of happens after the initial if statement is checked. So I'm just going to type this out and then I'll show you how this works. So I'm going to say L if. OK, so now what I've done is I've made this code a little bit cleaner. And the way I've done this is I've removed that kind of nested if statement that we had. And I've now implemented an L if instead. So what the elif does is if the initial condition is not true, it will then check another condition. So it says, OK, if this is true, we're going to do this. We're going to skip all of this. If this is not true, we're going to check this. If this is true, we're going to do this and we're going to skip whatever else is after it. However, if this is not true, then we're going to do whatever is in the else. So we're going to check this. If it's true, we do this. Otherwise, we check this. If it's true, we do this. And otherwise, if both of these things are false, we do what's in the else. And so that's just another way to do this rather than having what we have before, which was the else. And then all of this kind of indented in the else, right? This just cleans it up. And small note, you can have as many elif statements as you want. So I could add another one like this if I want to do that. Uh, but in our case, it doesn't really make any sense to do that. OK, so that's actually it. Uh, I'm not going to run the program. Just believe me, this this does work. And yeah, that is going to be our number guessing game. So I'll zoom out a bit so you guys can kind of see all of the code. But that is how that works. I guess there's not really much more to say about that. And now we'll move on to the next one. All right, so now we're moving on to rock, paper, scissors. Now, obviously, you guys know how this game works. But what I'm going to do here is make it so that the computer keeps track of how many times the user gets it correct versus how many times the computer gets it correct. And when I say correct, sir, I mean whoever wins uh, rock, paper, scissors. So the first thing we're going to do here is import random. Uh, now, small note here, when you are importing modules, uh, it's typically best practice to do it at the very top of the program. I see some beginners import the module like right before they use it. That's fine. You can do that. But it's just uh, better practice to have it right at the top. So it's really easy to see what stuff you've imported and obviously remove it. And then you can use it throughout the entire file. Whereas if I tried to use like random up here, uh, it doesn't work until after I've imported. Right. Uh, so hopefully that's clear. But anyways, that's what we're going to do. So what we need is we need two variables, one for the user score and one for the computer score. So I'm going to say user underscore wins is equal to zero. And I'll say computer underscore wins is equal to zero as well. All right. Now I'm going to have a while loop. I'm going to say while true. And the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to ask the user. Uh, actually, yeah, I'll ask the user to input rock, paper or scissors. And then I will also let them type in Q. Uh, like the letter Q. And if they do Q, then we'll just immediately quit the program. So let's handle that first. Let's say user underscore input is equal to input. And I'll say type. And then we can say rock slash paper slash scissors. Is scissors with, uh, with, with two S's? I think that's how you spell it. Okay, rock, paper, scissors. And well, paper should be spelled correctly. Okay, rock, paper, scissors. Or Q to quit. Okay. All right. So now that we have that, we will go down and we will check. Let me just zoom out so we can see this here, what the user actually typed in. So the first thing I want to do is I want to see if they typed in Q. So I will actually convert this to dot lower in kind of the way that I showed you we could do it previously. We'll take whatever the user types in, 
and we'll just convert it to dot lower. And actually, instead of a period, let me do a colon and let me add a space so it's not all smushed there. Okay, so type rock, paper, scissors, or Q to quit. And now I'm going to say if the user input, and this is converted to dot lower, right, is equal to Q, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit. Otherwise, I'm going to check if they typed in rock, paper, scissors, or if they type something else. And now I'm going to show you how we can check if the user input is equal to more than one thing, because previously I've been showing you how we can check if it's equal to just a string, right? But now I'll give you a little bit of a, I don't want to call it a hack, but a little bit of a trick so that you can see if the user typed in rock, paper, or scissors all in one line rather than writing three if statements. So I'm going to say if the user input is in, and I'm going to use a list. You guys probably haven't seen this before if you're uh, like a complete beginner in Python. And let me just kind of fix this a little bit. So P S I'm going to type it myself and I'll explain what's going on here. Okay. So let's make this in quotes. Okay. And then this needs to be in quotes too. Okay. I'm really messing this up quite badly, but you get the idea. Okay. So what I've done is I've just created a list. Now a list is anything encapsulated in these square brackets um, that is like separated by commas. So I have this rock paper and scissors string in this list. And so what I'm saying is if user input is in this list, I'm checking if whatever the user typed in exists in either of these three strings. So essentially we're just checking if the user typed in rock, paper, or scissors. Now you can put any strings in here that you want, uh, but we're just checking obviously if this is in here and that's how we can check multiple things on one line. There's other ways to do this too, but this is kind of one nice trick that we can use. So I'm going to say if user input, and I'm actually going to say is not in. Now this is another keyword again that you may not have seen before. What this is going to do is simply reverse the kind of thing that we were checking before. So we were checking if the user input was in rock, paper, scissors. So now when I say not in, I mean, obviously, as you would read it in English, this is checking if the user input is not in here. If it's not in here, that means they didn't type in something valid. And well, what we need to do is have them type in something valid. So what I'm going to do is say type continue here. And what this will do is just re ask them to type in rock, paper, scissors or Q. So we could give some error message saying that's not a valid option or something like that. But what I'm going to do is just have it so it keeps asking them to type something in until eventually they give us something valid. So when I hit continue, that means anything after here is not going to happen, right? If this continue is hit, we're just going to go back up to the top of the while loop. Sweet. And actually, rather than saying quit here, what I'm going to do is say break. So this will break out of the while loop. And then that will actually automatically end the program for us because we'll be at the end. Uh, we won't need to what do you call it? actually manually quit. So the break breaks out of the while loop, which means we'll go to wherever the end loop is done or whatever the while loop is done. And then we can actually just print something saying, you know, good. No, not not that uh, goodbye exclamation point. Sweet. OK, so now at this point in time, the user has given us valid input. They've typed in rock, paper or scissors. So what we need to do is generate a random number that represents rock, paper or scissors for the computer. So I'm going to say rand. Uh, I'll actually say, yeah, random underscore number is equal to. And then this is going to be uh, random dot rand int and we'll generate a number between zero and two. So if they type in zero, that can be rock. If they type in one, that can be scissors uh, or paper. If they type in two, that can be scissors. So let's write that down in a comment. Uh, to do a comment in Python, you hit the pound sign or use the pound sign like the number sign and then type anything after it. Anything on a line that comes after a pound sign will not be read by your Python interpreter. And it's just there so that as a programmer, it's easier to read and gives you like you know documentation or comments about what's going on. So I'm going to say rock is one or rock is zero. I'm going to say paper is one. I'm going to say scissors is and then two. Sweet. So the way that I'm going to do this now is I could do an if statement or right? I could write three if statements say, you know, if random number is equal to zero, then the computer picked rock. If random number is equal to one, if random number is equal to two, I actually don't need to do that. What I can do is uh, hmm, let, let's see here. OK, so what I'm going to do now here to actually assign uh, some variable equal to rock, paper, scissors to represent the computer's kind of choice is I'm going to use a list. Now, again, this might be a little bit confusing, but I think you guys will get the idea if I do this. I'm going to take this list right here, rock, paper, scissors. I'm actually going to store it in a variable. I'm going to say options is equal to rock, paper, scissors. And I'm going to change this here to be options. So this is the doing the exact same thing as before, except we're just storing this list of values now in this options variable. 
Now, if you haven't seen lists before, these are actually very interesting. They're known as a data structure and they are collections of elements, right? We have multiple elements, multiple strings stored in this list. And well, the way we access these different elements in this list, let's say I just wanted scissors or I just wanted paper, I just wanted rock, is we use what's known, an ind uh, known as an index. So if you write the name of your list, which in this case is options, that's the variable storing the list, you can put these square brackets and then you can put a numeric index that represents these different elements. So in this case, the different indices of this list are 0, 1, and 2. And if we had another element, right, let's just go, you know, test, then this would be index 3. So the way this works is you start counting at 0 and then you just go up by one every single time. So the very first element is indexed by zero, second one, third two, fourth three. And so that's all that is. So when I say options at zero, that's gonna give me rock. When I say options at one, that gives me paper. When I say options at two, that gives me scissors. And so I have some random number that's between zero and two, right? And zero represents rock, one represents paper, and two represents scissors. Let me get rid of test. So what I can do is say, uh, let's actually change this here. Say computer underscore guess or computer underscore pick, I guess, is equal to, and then this is going to be options at whatever the random number is, because this will be between zero and two. And so we'll use that as the index to actually access the string, the thing that the computer chose, right? Rock, paper, or scissors. So now what we can do is we can print out what the uh, computer chose. We can say computer picked. And then we can say comma and we can say computer underscore pick. And then we will decide who actually won, right? So then we'll say who won. And let me just do comma. Uh, actually, hmm, let's do plus and let's just add a period. The reason I'm not doing a comma and then the period is because if I do a comma, it will automatically add a space between this period and the computer pick, which I don't want. And so instead, we're just going to add the, uh, the dot like that. Okay, so we're going to say the computer picked that, and then we need to decide who won, right? And so to decide who won, we need to well compare uh, the user's pick to the computer's pick. So we're going to say if the user input is equal to, and then I guess we'll say rock, we'll then do kind of the winning condition for the user. So if the user picked rock, then what do they win against? Well, they win against scissors. And so now we need to check if the user picked rock and the computer picked scissors. So what I'm going to do is use this keyword called and and say computer underscore pick is equal to and then scissors. So if that's the case, we'll print out uh, you one exclamation point and then we will say user underscore wins plus equals one so that they get one more win. So what this and does is it checks if the condition on the left side and the condition on the right side are true. So what happens in this if statement or what's in this if statement will only happen if both of these things are true. Pretty straightforward. That's how the and works. Alternatively, there's an or and an or will kind of do the opposite. It will check if either the left or the right is true or both of them are true. If any of those three things happen, this is true, this is true, or both of them are true, then what's in the if statement will run. Whereas with the and, it has to be both of these being equal to true for what the if, what in the if statement is going to run, or if what's in the if statement is going to run, sorry, butchering my English here. Okay, so that's one of the win conditions for our user. And then if that's the case, we can just go ahead and say continue, and we can go back up to the top of the while loop and keep going. But we need to check the other win conditions, right? And there's two more win conditions. Let's go here and let's fix the indentation. Okay. Ta -da. And we'll say if the user input now is equal to paper and the computer picked, uh, what is it, rock, then that means that we won, right? And so we would add one to the win. And then the last one is we picked scissors and the computer picked paper. Sweet. So the reason I'm doing this continue here is because after we've determined that we've won, there's really no point in checking these other if statements. So we could instead do these in L ifs. So I could say if L if L if, and then actually I could remove all these continues. And in fact, let's do this. And uh, then we will go down here and we will say else. And then what we would do here is say print you lost. And then we will say computer wins. Okay plus equals one. So the reason this works now is because we check if we won with the rock versus scissors, we check if we won with paper versus rock, we check if we won with scissors versus paper. And if none of those are true, that means we didn't win, right? There's no point in checking if the computer beat us in all the other uh, scenarios. 
We just need to check if our three win conditions were true. If they are not true, then we know that we lost. And so we would print we lost and then we add our computer wins. And this is an example of using multiple LF statements. We'll check this one. If it's false, we'll check this one. If it's false, we'll check this one. If it's false, we run this. If any of these are true, we immediately stop and we do whatever is inside of here, uh, which is increment the user wins and print you won. Great. So now the last thing I'm going to say before I do goodbye is I'm just going to print out the number of user wins versus computer wins. So I'm going to say the user, or I'll say in this case, you, you one comma user underscore wins times, and then we'll print the computer one and then computer underscore wins times period. Great. So hopefully that is all good. Let's quickly run through what we've done because we wrote a lot of code here relatively quickly. As you can tell, I'm kind of picking up the pace a little bit as we go through this. So we have our user wins, our computer wins. We're importing random, which we've already discussed. We have our list. First time we've seen this called options has our three values in it. We have while true. We have user input equals input. And then we say type rock, paper, scissors or Q to quit. We make whatever they type in lowercase. We check if the user inputted Q. If they do, we break. We're done. We stop the program. If they didn't, then we check if the user input is not in the options. If it's not in the options, that means they didn't type a valid rock, paper or scissors. And so we press or we uh, go continue, which means we're going to start the loop again. And we're going to ask them to type something in. Then what we do if they typed in something valid is we generate a random number between zero and two. Uh, this is the like what it stands for. Rock is zero, paper is one, scissors is two. We make our computer pick. So computer pick is equal to options at whatever the index is of the random number. We then say, OK, the computer picked this. We then check if the user won based on what the computer picked. Right. And uh, yeah, that's all good. And then we increment computer wins or user wins. And we will keep going until eventually the user hits Q. Once we're done, we'll break out of the while loop and we'll print these three things. Let's run it. Let's see if it works. OK. Type rock, paper, scissors, or Q to quit. Let's just test Q. Okay, you won zero times, the computer won zero times. Goodbye. Nice, works. Okay, let's actually type something. Let's go rock. It says computer pick scissors. You won. Nice. Okay, type rock, paper, scissors, or Q to quit. Let's go paper, uh, computer pick scissors. You lost. Okay, that sucks. So let's go uh, scissors, uh, computer picked paper. You won. Nice. Let's go rock. Okay, and let's go Q. And then it says the computer won one time. You won three times. Goodbye. All right, so that is rock, paper, scissors, keeping track of how many times both the user and the computer wins. Now we're going to move on to the next project, which is the choose your own adventure game. All right, so this next project is one of my all time favorite beginner projects, and that is because it's so customizable. There's so much you can do with this. I'm really only going to talk about this for about five or 10 minutes because this is up to you guys to make this kind of as big as you want. So this is a choose your own adventure game. And I guess the best thing to relate this to, if you haven't heard of this before, is kind of these children books. And actually, they have books that aren't children versions, too. But they're kind of like pick your own story books where you'll go to a page. Right. And it will say, like, if you want to go left, turn to page like 42. If you want to, like, swim across the river, go to page 97, whatever. And then, like, it kind of brings you on all these different paths throughout the book based on decisions that you make. So same thing here. We're going to ask the user to make a bunch of different choices. We'll start with something simple like, do you want to play the game? Right. And then if they say yes, we'll say, OK, you know, you come to some bridge. Do you want to cross it or do you want to swim underneath it? And then based on what they say, if they cross the bridge, maybe we'll say, OK, you come to a dead end. Do you want to turn around or do you want to search the jungle? Whatever. Like you can be as creative as you want. I'm just coming up with stuff at the top of my head. But then if they had instead decide to swim under the bridge, maybe we say like, oh, you know, there was a crocodile and your, your journey ended, whatever. So you guys can make it as complex as you want, but I'll show you like the basic structure and kind of the nesting of statements and how it works. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm actually going to ask the user for their name. This is one. This is something I don't usually do, but I think this will be cool. So I'm going to say um, name is equal to input. I'm going to say type your name colon, and then I'm going to say print and I'm going to welcome the user. I'm going to say welcome comma name comma to this ad venture exclamation point. And then we'll actually get right into it. And before I even ask them if they want to play, what I will do is I will just say, like, I'll ask them for a choice. I'll say you come to a dirt road or something. Do you want to go left or right? Well, whatever. So the first thing I'm going to say here is answer in lower cases is equal to input. Um, and I'll say, hmm, 
you are on a dirt road. It has come to an end and you can go left or right. Uh, and then I will say, which way would you like to go? Question mark. Okay, so let's just go here. And notice that it's doing this auto formatting. You guys don't have to worry about this. It's just my uh, IDE auto formats my code when I save it. And so you can see it's kind of going on a new line. Uh, don't worry about it. You can just do yours in the same thing. But anyways, that's like my prompt. You're on a dirt road. It has come to an end and you can go left or right. Which way would you like to go? And I'm expecting them to type in left or right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check if they typed left or right. I'm going to say if answer is equal to left. And actually, before I do that, I'm going to convert this input here to dot lower. And I realized I kind of messed something up. Hopefully that fixed it. Okay. So we're going to say dot lower. And let me add the space here between the question mark. Okay. So answer equals equals left. So if the answer equals left, then we'll do something else. Otherwise, uh, we will actually we'll say L if answer is equal to right. And then else we'll say uh, print not a valid option, you lose. So I'm just going to make it so if they ever give us something that's not valid, they just immediately lose the game. Okay. So if the answer is equal to left, then uh, we need to pick what's going to happen when they go to the left. If the answer is equal to right, we need to decide what's going to happen if they go to the right. So I'll start by kind of doing the left path. And let me just put a print statement here so I don't get an error. Uh, you'll notice that if you don't have something indented after it's expecting something to be indented, it will like yell at you and be angry. So you can just put an empty statement like print uh, and that will kind of fix it. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask them another question. I'm going to say answer and you can name these variables whatever you want. Maybe it would make more sense to name them like Q2 or something, whatever. I'll say answer is equal to input. And I'll say, um, okay, like you come to a river. And you can walk around it or swim across. And I'll say type walk to walk around and swim to swim across and make sure that when you guys do this, you're kind of like, uh, you know, telling the user what they need to type in, because sometimes it's not intuitive on what they should be typing. And so I always try to give them the option, like tell them explicitly, like what I'm expecting them to type so they don't give me an invalid option, uh, like not intentionally, you know. So now I'm going to check inside of here if the answer is equal to swim l if the answer is equal to walk and then else i will print not a valid option you lose right so we'll do that okay so now i need two things to happen here so print and print okay so i'm going to pause for a second hopefully you're getting the idea of what's going on here right if they go left i ask them a different question and then i check inside of this if statement what they answer for that next question and then i do something else Whereas if they go right, I'm going to ask them a different question. And so it's cool because there's like all of these different paths that people can explore. And like if they only go left at the beginning, they're only exploring like half of the potential paths. And then as soon as they go right, there's all new different options. Now, you could have the same options for different um, things they type, right? If they decide to go left or right, you could, in theory, ask them the same question if they go left or if they go right. But I like to do it differently. I think that's more fun. So let's just kind of continue on this path here. I'll say if the answer is equal to swim, then I'll print um, you swam across and were eaten by an alligator. Is that how you spell alligator? Maybe you guys can tell my spelling is not the best. Okay, eaten, eaten. There you go, by an alligator. Nice. Now, if they decide to walk across, I'll say you walked for many miles, ran out of water and you lost the game, okay? So both of these options here were inbound. So if they decide to go left, it doesn't matter what they chose, they were just gonna lose. And so instead they have to go right. And so we've kind of ended the path now on the left, but if we wanted to, maybe swim was like the correct answer, quote unquote, we could add another path here. And we don't have to have them lose on one of these options, I could add another path for walk too, right? Like hopefully you're getting the idea, you can just chain these kind of if statements in as far as you want. So now let's do something for going right. And actually, before we do that, let's let's test this out and let's make sure you guys understand what's going on here. Okay, so type your name. I'm going to say Tim. It says, welcome, Tim, to this adventure. 
you're on a dirt road. It has come to an end and you can go left or right. Which way would you like to go? Let's go left. When I go left, it says you come to a river. You can walk around it or swim across. Type walk to walk around and swim to swim across. You're going to type swim. It says you swam across and we're eaten by an alligator. And then there you go. Boom. You lose, right? Okay. So now let's go and do something for right. So for right, I'm going to say answer is equal to input. Um, I'm going to say you come to a um, bridge. It looks wobbly. Do you want to cross it or head back? Question mark. And then the options I'll put here, I'm just going to put them in brackets. I'll say cross slash back to kind of really indicate, hey, that's the two things that you're supposed to be typing, cross or back. And then here, I'm going to just copy this if else structure just so I can fill it in. I'm going to say if the answer is equal to back, if the answer is equal to cross, and then I'll continue. So now I'm going to say if answer equals back, uh, you go back to the, um, I don't know, like main road, whatever. We can make this whatever you want. Now you can decide to drive forward. I don't know, drive to the left or go to the right. Or you know what? We can make going back just, just be the wrong option. We'll just say you go back and lose. I, I don't think you guys need me to uh, to give too much detail here because I'm having trouble coming up with this. Okay, so we're going to say that crossing is the correct option. So if they decide to cross, then what we're going to do here is now we're going to ask them another question. We're going to say answer is equal to input. We're going to say you cross the bridge and meet a stranger. Do you talk to them? And we'll say yes, comma, no, question mark. Okay, and then same thing here. We can say if answer is equal to yes, uh, L if answer is equal, oops, is equal to no, and then else we'll say not a valid option, you lose. So let me copy that. Okay, not a valid option, you lose. And then here again, we can decide what we want. So we'll say print, maybe yes is like the correct answer and it ends the game. We'd say um, you talk to the stranger and they give you gold, whatever you win exclamation point. Uh, otherwise, no, we could say print. Um, you ignore the stranger. If I could spell stranger correctly and they are offended and you lose. <laughs> okay. So again, I, I'm just like randomly coming up with this stuff. I'm sure you guys are laughing at the, the options that I'm, I'm, I'm going with here, but I'm just trying to show you the structure of this program and kind of how like the nesting works so that you can make this as advanced as you want. So now we've kind of implemented something for the right. So it asks you a question. Uh, obviously you lose if you go back. Uh, if you go to decide to cross, then you're asked another question. You cross the bridge, meet a stranger. Do you talk to them? If the answer is yes, you lose or you win. If the answer is no, you lose. If you answer something that's not one of those, then uh, what do you call it? Uh, you lose. And then of course, if you wanted to keep going from here, rather than telling them they lose or they win, you would just ask them another question and you would keep doing this and keep nesting this if and else. And you can make multiple options too. You don't have to just do two options. You can make it so they could give you three options. You can make it so that you store one of their options in a variable like name, right? And then you use that variable later on. Like maybe they picked up a, I don't know, like a weapon or something really early. And if the weapon they chose really early is not correct when they go down a certain path, then maybe they lose. Whereas if it was correct, then maybe they can continue on or something like that. And so lastly, I'm going to say print. Thank you for trying comma. And then this is going to be their name. OK, so let's run this and I'll just go through a few of the paths. But that's pretty much going to wrap up this game. There's, there's not really much more to show you. Uh, this is just a cool one. And I always find this fun. And obviously you guys can come up with better stories than I can. So type your name. I'm going to say, Tim, welcome, Tim, to this adventure. You're on a dirt road. It's come to an end. You can go left or right. I'm going to go right. OK, you come to a bridge. It looks wobbly. Do you want to cross or head back? I'm going to cross. You cross the bridge and meet a stranger. Do you talk to them? No. It says you ignore the stranger and they're offended and you lose. Thank you for trying, Tim. Right. There you go. Then we could try this again. Type your name, Tim. Uh, you're on dirt road. Let's go left. Right. You come to a river. Let's walk. And it says you walked for many miles, ran out of water, and you lost the game. I'm not going to go through all the options. I think you guys get the idea now. That is the choose your own adventure game. Again, this code will be linked in the description if you want to download it. But this is kind of the template. 
use the if, elif, and else structure and you know make this as advanced and complex as you want. Now let's move on to the last project, which is the password manager. All right, so now we're moving on to the last project, which is a password manager. Now the point of this program is to kind of organize and store your passwords. So we're going to store all of the passwords along with the username or the account they're associated with in a text file, but we are not going to store the passwords in plain text. We're going to encrypt the passwords. Now, even though we're encrypting these passwords, which means they're going to need a kind of password to be able to decrypt them. So like there's like a master password for all of the passwords. This is not a secure way of storing your passwords. Do not rely on this for anything other than like a fun Python project. And I personally would not recommend storing at least any of your very sensitive passwords uh, in this method. It's just like a cool thing. And I wanted to show you how to do it. And it's kind of a more advanced project out of the five that we've done. So the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to going to write the code that's allowing us to actually ask the user whether they want to list out their passwords or whether they want to add a new one. And we're going to store all of these in a text file. So I'll do this project first without encrypting any of the passwords, and then we'll go in and encrypt them. So the first thing that we need to do is ask the user for like a master password. So we're going to say uh, PWD is equal to input and we'll say, what is the master password question mark? Now we're not actually going to validate this password is equal to something. We're going to use this password to encrypt our, uh, our passwords. So if they type in the wrong password here, it's still going to work. Like the program will operate, but it won't show them the correct password. And you'll see how that means when we kind of get later into the, uh, into the video, uh, regardless, what I'm going to do now is ask them what mode they want to go in. So whether they want to add a new password or whether they want to view their passwords. So I'm going to say, um, mode is equal to input. And we'll say, would you like to add a new password or view existing ones question mark? And then the uh, two inputs I'll allow will be, I guess, view and add. OK, so that's what I'm expecting them to type in. Now what I'm going to say is if mode is equal to view, we will do something. Uh, otherwise, L if mode is is equal to what I say, add, we will do something else. Otherwise, else we'll say print in valid mode. And I'm going to take all of this and I'm going to put this inside of a while loop. So I'm going to say while true because we'll allow them to like add a password, then view them and like so on and so forth. And so in this else here, I'll just say invalid mode and then I'll say continue and what this will do will bring them to the top of the wallet and then i'm also going to add something here that says uh press q to quit and then i'm going to convert all of this to dot lower and then i'm going to check at the very top here i'm going to say if mode equals equals q then break the wall loop okay Sweet. And then we could make this an elif, but we don't have to make it an elif since we have a break here. Uh, if this is true, it just won't even bother checking these. So up to you, but I'm not going to add the uh, the elif. OK, so now that we have this, what I'm going to do is show you something called a function. So I'm going to create two functions here. I'm going to say define uh, view and I'm going to say pass and then I'm going to say define and this is going to be add. OK, so what a function is, is an executable reusable block of code. So the way you call a function is you write the name of it, which is this, okay? And then two parentheses. So the basic syntax is you write def to define a new function, space, name of the function, open and closing parentheses, and then any parameters that you want inside of here. I'm not gonna really talk about what that is because I'm not trying to teach functions here. I'm just trying to show you how we can kind of split our code into different sections. And anyways, the way you call a function is by its name and then the open and closing parentheses. So if I put say like print, Tim inside of here, then I could call this function a bunch of times. And every single time I call this function, it would do whatever is inside of here, which would print Tim. So if I had, you know, print Tim twice, every single time I call the function, it's going to print out Tim two times. Whatever's indented inside of here just happens when you call the function. Pretty straightforward. But the point of me creating these two functions is that rather than writing all of the code related to the view mode and the add mode in the while loop, I'm going to put them in this function. So it's a little bit more organized and easier for me to kind of separate my program. So I'm just going to have pass inside of here right now. Now pass is a keyword that literally does nothing. It is just there to make it so you don't get any like indentation errors because you need to have something indented after the colon. And so for now, we're just going to write pass. And you can see we've done that here too. So now instead of just using pass, I'm going to call the view function. I'm going to call the add function. 
So now, depending on what mode you select, it's going to call these two functions, which will then perform the operations for that mode. It's just a cleaner way to write the code. It makes it a little bit more organized. OK, so let's start with the uh, the add function. What I want to do is create a new file if the file storing our password doesn't already exist and add the password into it. So the first thing I need to do is get the user account or whatever the username and then the password. And then I want to add it into the file. So I'm going to say, uh, I guess name is equal to input and we'll say account name like that. And then we'll say PWD, which stands for password is equal to and actually sorry, this should just say password because we already have PWD up here. And in fact, let's call this master underscore PWD and then we can call this PWD. So PWD is equal to input. And we'll say password colon like that. So now they're inputting their account name and their password. Now what I want to do is open a file or create a file if it doesn't already exist and add this password in. So I'll explain what this is doing in a second, but I'm going to say with open the name of my file, which in this case is going to be uh, passwords.txt. We're going to just use a text file for now. Then we're going to say comma, and then we need to define the mode to open this file with. Now the mode we're going to use is a, which stands for append. We're going to say as F. And now I'll explain what I just did. So when you use this with thing right here, this allows you to then do some things indented after it. And the point of this with when you're opening a file specifically is that as soon as you are done doing all of the operations with the file, since we use this with, it will automatically close the file for us. So you can open a file like this. You can say file equals open and there you go. Now you have file. But the thing is, if you do this, you need to make sure you manually close the file after you open it. Because if you don't do that, your Python process will still be kind of like holding on to and using this file. And it's going to cause problems if you try to open this file somewhere else. And so it's just better and safer to kind of use this with keyword because now you don't have to manually close it. It will automatically close the file for you. So anyways, I'm going to say with open passwords.txt in a mode. Now, so this is the name of the file. The next thing is the mode to open the file in. Now, there's a bunch of different modes. The main ones are W, R, and A. Now, W means write. And what this will do is create a new file or override this file if it already exists. Very important you understand this. If passwords.txt already exists and you open it in W mode, it will clear that file and make an entirely new one. So only use W mode if you want to always override a file that potentially already exists. OK, then there's R mode. This is just simply read mode. You can't write anything into the file if you open it in read mode. All you can do is just read the file. That's R mode. And obviously, this is not going to destroy a file if it already exists. In fact, there'll be a problem if you try to open the file and it doesn't exist in R mode. Then you have A mode. This is append mode. This is probably the most flexible mode. What this allows you to do is add something to the end of an existing file and create a new file if that file does not exist. So if passwords.txt does not exist, a new file will be created called passwords.txt, and then we can write to the file. If passwords.txt already exists, we are able to write to the file and read the file from the very end. Uh, so sorry, we can write to the file from the very end, and we can just read the entire file when we open it in A mode. And so for adding something, we're going to open in A mode, because if it exists, we append to the end. If it doesn't, we create it. Awesome. So now what we're going to do is say f.write. That's the name of our file because we said as f. And then we are going to write in the name plus the pipe plus PWD. So what this is going to do is take the name. It's going to separate uh, the password with the pipe operator, and then it's going to put the password. And then we will have user and password inside of the file. So let's actually try this out. Let me run this. You can see it says, what is the master password? I just type whatever for now. I'll just type hello. And would you like to add a new password or view existing ones? View comma add, press Q to quit. Okay, I'm going to type add. And then it says account name. Let's just go Tim password. Let's go is underscore great. Okay, so now I'm just going to quit. Notice this passwords.txt file has been created. If I open it, I now have Tim and is great. And if I were to do this again, it would add the next line in. So actually, let me rerun this. Let me say add account name uh, Joe password is Billy. And then notice it gets added in here. The thing is, though, it got added on the same line. And I don't want this to be added in the same line. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to quit here and I'm going to make it so that I go to the next line after I add each password. And the way I do that is I add what's known as a line break. Uh, I think this is actually called a carriage return, maybe a line break. 
at the end of the line. So every single time I add a line, I tack on this little invisible character backslash n. This won't actually appear on the line. You won't see this on the line, uh, but we will add that on. And what that tells the text editor to do is to go to the next line. So now the next time we write something in, it will be on the next line. So if I look at this um, and, and we run this now, add Tim A and five, four, three, two. And now if you look here, it goes to the next line. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. But uh, there you go. I'm just going to delete everything in that file. I'm going to quit this. And now we are able to add uh, passwords and usernames into the file. What I'm going to do now is make it so that we can view all of the passwords. So to view all of the passwords, I need to again open this file. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to say with open and then this is going to be passwords.txt a as f. I'm going to change this from a to be r because I don't want to potentially create a new file or anything like that. I just want to read the existing file. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop through the lines of the file and just print them out. So I'm going to say for line in f. I'm going to say dot read and actually read lines is what I want to do. Now, what read lines is going to do is just exactly what it says. It's going to take the file. Sorry, this should be F. It's going to read all of the lines for it. And then what I can do is use a for loop to get all of the lines of the file. So let's just look at this. I'm going to say print line and let's just see what happens now if we go to view mode and then I'll kind of walk through this more. So let's run uh, master password doesn't matter. Let's say view. And then, oh, there's nothing in the file, so it didn't show us anything. OK, so let's go add uh, account name. Let's go Tim password test. And now let's say view. And then notice it shows us Tim and test, but it's printing a new line after it shows us this account name and this password. And so I'm going to show you how we can kind of fix this now. So the thing is, remember how I told you we're adding this kind of invisible backslash at the carriage return. Now, when we read the file, we actually read in that carriage return. And so we need to strip this carriage return from our line. And the way we do that is we use this thing called our strip. Now, what our strip will do is it will strip off the carriage return from our line. So that's all you have to know. Just our strip. That's what it will do. There's also something called strip and strip will strip off uh, the carriage return as well. But our strip is like more specifically exactly for this. So what I'm going to do now is run the file or run the program. Master password doesn't matter. I'm going to say view. And now notice that it's not printing that new line after we print this line uh, because we stripped off the carriage return. Great. So now the thing is, though, I'm printing Tim pipe test. I kind of want to figure out or separate the username from the password. So how are we going to do that? Well, I'm going to say that my data is equal to line dot r strip. And then I'm actually going to split this data. So I'm going to say my user and pass is equal to and sorry, this should be pass w is equal to data dot split at and this is going to be a pipe operator. Now, this might seem really confusing because, uh, again, this is a beginner project. I know a lot of you guys haven't seen the syntax before. What dot split will do is it will take a string. It will look for this character right here and it will split the string into a bunch of different items uh, every single time one of these characters is found. So if you had like hello, pipe, Tim, pipe, yes, pipe two, whatever, what would happen is this uh, data dot split would actually return to you the following. It would return to you a list that says hello, Tim, yes, and two. So it would remove all of these pipe characters and it would give you all of the unique strings that are between these pipe characters in a list format. And so to access these different elements, you would use index 0, 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. Now, the thing is, we know we're only ever going to have one pipe operator, right? Unless the uh, the password or the username contains a pipe operator, but we're just going to assume that it doesn't contain a pipe operator just to make our life a little bit easier. If it did contain a pipe operator, there'd be some more steps we have to do. I'm not going to do them for right now. Anyways, we know we're only going to have one pipe operator, which means the list that's going to be returned to us will only have two elements in it. In fact, it will always have two elements in it. So what that means is that we can actually just grab both of those two elements by saying user comma pass W. So when you do something like user comma pass W, this assigns the first element in the list to user and the second element in the list to pass W. And since we know our list always has two elements, that means we can do this, right? Whereas if we had three elements, we would then have to add another variable, right? And then X would be assigned to X. Hopefully that makes sense, but that's why we can do what we're doing. And that's kind of what the split operator does. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out user 
colon, comma, user, and then password, cola, comma, password, or pass w, right? So now it'll look a little bit nicer. So let's go ahead and try this. I'm going to quit this program. I'm going to rerun it. It's going to say, what is the master password? Say test. I'm going to view. So now when I view, it says user Tim password test. And I think I should do like a separator between the user and the password. And so what I'm going to do is just add a comma like that. OK, so now if we run this, let's quit. Let's rerun master password test. Would you like to add a new password? I'm going to say view it says user Tim comma password test. And there you go. And we could actually even split this up with a pipe operator. I think that will look cleaner. I'm not going to run it now, but we'll do it with the pipe. Sweet. So now we're able to add passwords and we're able to view them. But the problem is I can just look at this file and I can see what the password is. And well, that's not very good. We don't really want to do that. So we need to encrypt these passwords. All right. So how do we encrypt a password? Well, this is where it gets a little bit more difficult. That's why I've kind of waited until this point to do the encryption. So you guys could at least follow along with this part, see how to write to files, read from files, all that kind of stuff there. Uh, so the way that you encrypt a password, we could write a manual encryption algorithm, but I'm not going to do that. That's a bit beyond the scope of this tutorial is we use a module by someone way smarter than all of us who knows how to do encryption. And the way that we use this module is we need to install it. So remember at the beginning of the video, I was telling you when we imported random that, hey, we there's also other modules that are built by random people, right? Uh, that we can use. But the thing is, we have to install them because they're not by default installed with Python. So this is where a lot of you are probably going to have problems if you haven't done this before. But open up your terminal or your command prompt, depending on your operating system, doesn't matter which one, and just type pip install and then type cryptography, if I can spell it like that. Pip install cryptography. Just press enter and pray that this works for you. <laughs> now, if this doesn't work for you, don't worry. I'm going to show you how to fix this. Uh, but for some of you, that should have worked. If that works for you, you're good. You can kind of skip probably the next minute of this video because I'm just going to explain how to fix this. If this doesn't work for you, try the following command, OK? Pip3 install cryptography. Pip3 install cryptography. Press Enter. See if that works. If that doesn't work for you, try Python hyphen M pip install cryptography. If that doesn't work for you, try Python 3 hyphen M pip install cryptography. If none of those work for you, this means that pip is not installed on your system. Pip is uh, actually a recursive acronym that stands for pip installs packages. And well, what it does is it installs packages for you. And by default, when you install Python, it's not included in the installation. I don't know why they don't just include it by default. You have to like check a little box to say to install it. So you could just reinstall Python and check that box that says uh, fix pip. Or you can follow the two videos that I have that are linked in the description, one for Mac, one for Windows, showing you how to fix this command. Now, they're not directly called like how to fix pip. They show you how to install a module called Pygame. But when it comes to installing the Pygame thing, just instead of doing Pygame, do, uh, do cryptography. OK, so you need to install this cryptography cryptography module. Sorry. Once you have that installed, we're good to go. If you know what a Python interpreter is and you have multiple on your system, this is going to be a bit more complicated. You need to make sure you're using the right Python interpreter when you're running your code, the one that you install cryptography into. OK, so at this point in time, I'm going to assume you've successfully installed cryptography. Uh, once you've done that, what you need to do is import it. So you're going to say from and then cryptography like that dot and you're going to uh, type this thing called Fernet. Uh, yeah, Fernet like that. And then you're going to import Fernet. Now I'm looking at a cheat sheet I have because this is not something I do very often, so I don't have this memorized. Uh, but this is a module that is going to allow you to encrypt text, essentially. Now, the first thing that we need to do when we use this is we need to define what's known as a key. So essentially what this is going to do for you, and I'm not going to talk about it too much, is it is going to um, take a string of text and using a key, turn it into a completely kind of random string of text that you cannot get back to the original text from without knowing the key. Now, this key is something that we're going to combine with our master password. So imagine you have this key, OK? And then we have our password. So the key plus this password is what we're going to use to encrypt our text. Now, that means that if you type in the wrong password, when you go to decrypt the text, what's going to happen is you're going to get something that makes no sense. It's not going to be the original text because you need the key plus the password to be able to get back to the original text. So it's kind of key plus password plus, you know, text to encrypt. And then that equals like random text. OK, and then you have random text plus key plus password 
equals and then text to encrypt. Now, this is obviously like a, a vast simplification of what's going on here, uh, but that's kind of what we're going to do with this module. So the master password in combination with the key that we're going to store will be able to encrypt and decrypt our text. If you type in the wrong master password, you will have a wrong decrypted text. OK, so what we need to do is write two functions, one function that can create a key for us and one function that can store a key. So I'm or sorry, retrieve a key. So I'm going to say define write underscore key. I'm just copying this from my sheet over here uh, that I have on my other monitor. I'm going to say key is equal to fernet dot and then generate underscore key. I'm then going to say with open and I'm going to say key dot key. This is a key file uh, and then WB. This stands for write bytes mode as key underscore file. And then I'm going to say key underscore file dot write key. OK, so what this is doing is going to open a file. It's going to create this file called key.key .key in WB mode, which means write in bytes. You don't really have to know what that means. It's just a special file format. And then you press as key file and or sorry, as key file and then key file dot write. And you're going to write in this key that was generated by this thing called Fernet. OK, that's what we're using up here that we've imported. So you're going to write or sorry, you're going to run this function one time. And when you run this function one time, it's going to create this key file for you. So let me show you when I just call write key here. Uh, after I input the master password, it will then create this. So let's run this and then just type some random thing. And then notice here we get this key file. OK, and inside of here you have this key. Boom. Good. Now remove the call to write key. You can keep this function in if you want, but you don't need it anymore because you already have the key. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment it out. So to do a multi line comment in Python, you use three uh, quotation marks, single or double. Just make sure they're the same on both sides. Uh, you do three at the start of the comment, three at the end. And so now I've commented out this function to make sure I don't use it again, because if I use it again, uh, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> OK, now that we've done that, we need a function to load this key. So in a similar way, actually, I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to change this now to be load key. Like that. And actually, I probably shouldn't have copied that. I'm just going to say return open. And then this is going to be key dot key and then dot read and the mode is going to be RB mode. Now the thing is, I need to take this here. I need to say file is equal to open. I'm then going to say file dot read. I'm going to store this in uh, key and then I'm going to say file dot close just to remind you that you got to close your file every time you open it. OK, so I'm opening the file in write or sorry, read slash bytes mode. So it's reading bytes. I'm then going to read the file. I'm then closing the file and then I'm returning the key. Again, you don't really have to understand exactly how this is working. This is just part of the decryption stuff. OK, so now we have the key. So now that we have the key, what we're going to do at the top of our program here is we're going to load it. We're going to say key is equal to load underscore key, which means this function needs to go above where I'm calling. So this is another interesting thing. Let me copy this right key as well and put it up here. Whenever you want to use a function, it needs to be defined before you use it. So I couldn't have this function defined below this line. If I did that, that would mean that uh, I wouldn't be able to use this function because it wasn't yet created when I tried to use it. So I got to create it first, then I can use it, obviously. OK, so now that we have that, what I'm going to say is uh, fur is equal to fernet. I'm going to pass key. Now, this is just initializing this kind of encryption module. So you're writing Fernet, you're going to pass it the key. OK, so actually, I'm realizing I made a mistake here. I just got to take this stuff and I got to put this below the master password. So I'm going to say uh, master password, then key equals low key for equals Fernet key. But then I'm going to change my key to be key is equal to load key plus the master password two bytes. Now, you probably don't know what this means. Uh, bytes is kind of a different way of storing information. You've probably heard of bits and bytes before, not the snack, but like in terms of uh, in terms of computing, right? You have bit and then you have bytes. And well, regardless, we have our key in bytes. And so we need to convert our master password into bytes so that uh, this works, so we can add this together. Now, just like when you add two strings together, that's exactly what's happening here. We're taking the key, which is in this file, and we're just adding uh, this master password in its bytes format to this key and then using that as the actual key. OK, hopefully that's clear. That's like a lot of the hard stuff. Now, encrypting stuff is really easy. So what I'm going to do now is when I go ahead and write my password, I'm going to first convert this password 
into its encrypted version. So I'm going to say uh, fur dot and then encrypt. And I'm just going to surround my password with that. But first, I need to encode my password. Now, the reason I need to encode this is because encoding my password will convert this into bytes. And actually, I'm realizing here that this is going to be better. I'm going to say master password dot encode rather than dot bytes. Again, all encode does is it takes your string, turns it into bytes. And so same thing here. I'm taking my password. I'm turning it into bytes with dot encode and then I'm encrypting it and I'm going to store that uh, beside the name. And I also realize that now I need to convert this to a string. So I'm going to say string for dot encrypt PWD dot encode. And this will now uh, encrypt and encode our password. OK, so now when we store these passwords, they should be stored in an encrypted format. So now the thing is we need to decrypt them when we show them. So to do that is going to be literally the exact same thing we just had here. So I'm going to copy this, except instead of encrypt, it's going to be decrypt. OK, so we're going to say decrypt like that. And then instead of PWD, this is going to be uh, pass W. OK, so I'm hoping this is going to work. I have a feeling it's not. I think I made a small mistake here, but we'll we'll worry about that when we get to it. OK, so now we should hopefully be storing encrypted information and reading non encrypted information. So let me go in passwords and let me delete this because that is not encrypted. And so that's going to give us a problem right now. And let's go here and let me rerun this app. OK, what is the master password? We now need to pick the master password that we want to use to encrypt our data. So I'm just going to make mine Tim, make yours whatever you want. Would you like to add a new password? Yes, want to add account name. We're going to say maybe just like Facebook password. We'll say Tim is great. OK, would you like to add a new password or view an existing one? I'm going to say view and then we get a problem. It says invalid token. OK, so let me have a look here and see what's wrong. But if we go to passwords.txt, you can see that we are storing this in the file. And now I've actually already determined what's wrong. But uh, let me just collect my thoughts and I'll be right back. So I've realized the problem here, and it is that we are writing in this B. Uh, what is it? I guess this is a quotation mark and then another quotation mark here. And we can't be doing that. So I'm actually going to clear this file. So the, the thing here in Python, and this is I guess I can teach you about bytes now. When you write a B and then you have uh, something after this, like I say B and then hello, this is a bytes string. This is different than the string hello. When you have this little B before, this means bytes. So the thing is, we were writing in this little B and we don't want to do that because when we do that, that means when we try to decrypt this, it's all wrong because we have this B and this quotation mark and well, it's just incorrect. We can't be writing that into the file. And so what I did before is you saw I had a string surrounding this in our ad file. We can't have that. Instead of having a string, we need to decode this. So I forgot that we have this thing called decode. It's the opposite of encode. It's going to take a bytes string and decode it to a regular string. So now if we decode this, all should be good. And same thing here. I've, I had a, what do you call it? String like that. And that's no good. I couldn't do that. Instead, I just have to have fur dot decrypt and then pass w dot encode. So I'm going to take the string in because I'm writing in a string that's not bytes. It's just a string. And then what I'm going to do is convert that string into bytes and then decode that byte string. And then that should work. So now let's see if this works. I'm going to rerun the program. Paul apologize about that mistake. I'm going to say, what is the master password? We're going to go Tim. Would you like to add? I'm going to say add account name. Let's just go Joe password one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK, now I'm going to say view. When I say view, it gives me uh, user Joe password B and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's showing me this bytes thing. If I want to remove this bytes thing, I need to decode this. So I'm going to decode like that. And now if I quit here and I rerun and I type in the master password, which is Tim, and I press view or type view, uh, none type object has no attribute decode. Uh, hmm. OK, what is the problem here? I was printing out this. Oh, sorry, guys, I added the dot decode at the end of the print statement, not at the end of this fur thing. So I had it like after this bracket, it needs to be after this second closing bracket. So let me rerun this. Let me type in Tim. Let me type in view. And now notice it gives me the correct password. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. However, if I go to passwords.txt, you can't see the correct password, right? It's storing this like a random string of gibberish that really like means absolutely nothing. And so if I actually quit this, let me just clear the screen and rerun. Uh, let's go to password manager. Let's go to run. And I type in the incorrect password. I'll just type Tim two and I type view. Notice it still gives me the correct password. OK, it's interesting that it's giving me the correct password. It shouldn't be giving me the correct password. So let me look at this for a second. OK, so I'm going to apologize here because I made a mistake. 
I thought that we were going to be able to use a master password in combination with our key and just do some kind of like hackish manipulation to get this to work. Unfortunately, it looks like doing that's way more complicated than I thought. I just was looking on the internet right now. In fact, I'll bring up the documentation that I found. Um, so we're using this thing called Fernet, right? And there's a way to use passwords with Fernet, but I mean, you guys can kind of read this here. It's a little bit complicated and I don't really want to put you guys through all of this because this is just a beginner project. So I will leave a link to this documentation in the description if you'd like to have a look at how to do this. But for now, I think I'm going to end the video here. So I'm just going to remove this master password feature. Obviously, that's pretty important, right? Like you would want to have a master password. So I really do apologize about that. But if you do this now and you just use the key as you used it before, um, everything will still work. So right now, if you run the program and, and I'll show you and we don't have a master password, says, would you like to add a password to view? If I type view, it gives me the correct passwords, right? Even though we use technically a different key that had the addition of our master password to kind of encrypt them previously, this still works. So anyways, that is where I'm going to leave it. Again, I'll leave a link to that documentation that shows you how to implement the master password in the description. Just too complicated for me to feel comfortable going through it in this kind of beginner tutorial. All right. So with that said, I hope you guys enjoyed these five mini Python projects. I hope they kind of gave you something to work on, maybe taught you a little bit about Python and at minimum, you know, gave you a cool project that you can kind of extend and add on to. If you guys like these type of videos, please make sure to leave a like. Let me know what you want to see in the future in the comments down below, and I will see you in another YouTube video.